Um, hey, so I'm Tim O'Shea. Uh, I'm from Virginia Tech. Uh, I'm just a researcher there. Um, and uh, I wanted to talk a bit about uh, kind of the possibilities for tensor signal processing and then kind of bleed into how that bleeds into machine learning uh, as well. Um, so um, just to set the background, um, I'm sure a lot of you have been watching this, but you know, what's been going on in machine learning and kind of the resurgence of neural networks has been pretty awesome to watch. Um, and this has primarily been in the, the computer vision area. Um, and so there's a lot of people in like the self-driving car uh, area as well as like facial and object recognition areas and natural language processing where we've made like lots and lots of advances in, in recent time in driving down error rates on translation and object recognition and all these things. Um, and if you look at it, so neural networks from a computational standpoint are really interesting because they have this fairly well-defined uh, compute structure uh, that constitutes a network, right? And so um, the, if you look at kind of the calculations for, for a neural network, you have this kind of it's really basically a big multiply accumulate for each layer. So you have this, these inputs that are multiplied with a series of weights that are summed and then run through some nonlinearity, like a sigmoid function. Um, and, and that's basically one layer in a neural network. Um, now, if you look at these so-called convolutional layers, uh, you no longer have a separate weight on each input, but you have these weights that are tied in a way such that when you slide a patch across an input, um, you replicate the same weights at different shifts, right? So that's it's really the only difference. Um, and then if you look at some of the bigger models, so this is from like a year and a half or ago, one of Google's vision networks for doing object recognition. Um, you think of that transfer function for a layer, you know, that's one box in this network, right? So we now have this network, which is, you know, 40 or 50 layers. Some of the ones this year were over 100 layers deep uh, in the, the complexity that they're, they're doing to do this object recognition. Um, so there's been a really, really strong software ecosystem to support machine learning for computer vision. Um, and it's really kind of starting to centralize around this kind of tensor programming model. Um, it, it, and, and this is really, uh, you know, interesting because you're, you're building these, these big tensor graph expressions. Um, and then, you know, as a big abstract data flow uh, representation, and then you kind of map it down to hardware to run. Um, so uh, two of these architectures are, are kind of Theano and TensorFlow. Um, Theano was, was around kind of first uh, and kind of pioneered this, and then Google like secretly rewrote it internally and then eventually released it to the world, and now they're both very popular. Um, but uh, the whole idea here is um, these are basically uh, libraries that allow you to write big uh, NumPy expressions, essentially, where you have many operations that are kind of forming a data flow uh, graph. Uh, and then take it, and, uh, and the idea is you build this graph expression, um, and then you go through the back end, uh, and, you, and you go out to any one of a number of targets. Um, and so right now, um, we go to basically GCC and CUDA as the back end. Um, but there's a lot of plans underway at Google to do this thing called XLA, which is like their next generation tensor backend. Uh, and they're, they're, they're doing a lot of work to sync this up with LLVM uh, so they can actually just use kind of LLVM uh, abstract representation to pass it in. Uh, and then there's a lot of rumors about potential uh, support on like the, the QDSPs that Qualcomm builds for baselines, uh, as well as uh, some of the Xilinx chips. There's, there's been Put a lot of talking about Xilinx potentially supporting this as a co-generator. So it's really cool. Um, we may have finally a, a language that we can target to a lot of different kind of platforms um, from this, this kind of way to express things. Um, so this is used heavily for neural networks, but it's not really neural network specific. So if you look at this, is basically a simple expression. Uh, we start by defining these variables like A and B, and we can define operations on them like adding or multiplying. Um, and then eventually we go into our session and we evaluate these expressions. And so this is basically building up your big, in this case, a very small uh, kind of data flow graph. Uh, and then this is going to be compiling and running your, your graph. Right? So you can build much bigger things in this. Um, so uh, I talked a little bit before about GR TensorFlow. Um, and the whole idea is uh, 
you know, really at the core of this, this is just kind of like a, a, a kernel work call, right? So we can wedge it right into a Gnradio block and use it to, to uh, offload these tensor operations from within a work function. <laughs> um, and so this is something uh, added a couple months ago. And the whole idea here is, um, you know, can we take a, a sync interpolator of a signal and offload that uh, onto a GPU or onto whatever uh, using this kind of tensor language? Um, and so this is basically the definition of a, uh, a sync interpolation, right? Um, and so you're going through here. And, and up at the top, you're defining the, the graph through this series of uh, castings, you know, tiling of the input, uh, doing these gather operations, which are basically uh, uh, index lookups into vectors, uh, and then doing a reduced sum, which is basically just a big multiply accumulate. Um, and so uh, once we've kind of issued these commands, we, we've built this, this kind of dependence graph uh, for the operation. Um, and now, whenever we run it, um, we could change the back end to either the CPU or the GPU or, you know, some of the, the targets that are probably coming soon. Um, and so uh, that's kind of just an example. Um, I think there's not many people out there using this for pure signal processing like this yet. Um, but I think there's a huge, um, a huge potential for it. Uh, the tensor languages are, are pretty expressive for almost any of the comms problems we have. Uh, and uh, the, the kernel compilers and optimizers are really quite good. Um, so this is kind of a, a, a pretty exciting way to offload onto GPUs and things. All right, so I'm going to kind of switch over to the machine learning side. Uh, so that, that was kind of basic signal processing, but I guess my research now is really centered around, okay, how do we take these machine learning ideas and apply them to radio uh, technology and radio communications. And so these are just kind of a couple of the, the questions you might ask, you know, can we apply it in these ways? Um, and so really I've been looking at, you know, can you learn entirely new communication schemes? Uh, or can we just learn algorithms to, to put into our current waveforms as different subsystems? Uh, and then kind of in a sensing scenario, you may want to know, you know, what's around you in your interference environment, uh, like Tom was talking about this morning where you may have um, EMI emissions from your, uh, you know, your power supply or whatever. Uh, you, you may want your system to be aware of all these emitters around you when it makes decisions about setting up the communications link. Uh, and then just how to optimize existing systems. So these are kind of some of the, the high level goals, right? Um, so this is some of the, the earlier work from this year. And I think uh, we saw a little bit in the, the GR inspector um, talk, which was awesome. Um, so th the whole idea here is, you know, for a long, long time, uh, when we looked at doing modulation recognition, uh, which is kind of a classical communication sensing task, um, the approach was generally to, to do um, this expert feature approach where you, you extract a bunch of uh, uh, high order moments or high order cumulants, uh, along with maybe statistics on the, the signal and the, the phase and the envelope. Um, and here we're kind of, we're trying to go to a whole different route of just let's instead, let's go to feature learning on the raw input signal um, and just put the I and Q in and let it learn a whole new set of its own features. Um, and, and it's funny, I mean, if you look at what's happened in the image, the computer vision domain, this is exactly, you know, what is, what has happened. So until five or 10 years ago, there was a whole discipline of feature engineering in vision. Um, which has been largely replaced now with, with these kind of end-to-end -end learned features. Um, and so I think a lot of this is going to happen in the comms and the radio space as well. Um, and so this is really kind of showing that for modulation recognition, we can do pretty much the same thing. Um, so, so we start, there's a, a data set that's up on uh, the website. And, uh, you know, this is basically just using Guinea Radio to generate a whole bunch of synthetic signals uh, through a whole bunch of uh, synthetic channels that use the dynamic fading model. Um, and then this is kind of what, what we use for that experiment. Um, so this is just essentially, uh, you know, this is basically just a, a small convolutional neural network that we're using to do this uh, classification. Um, and if we look at performance, um, there's kind of a bunch of the solid ones here are different variations of a kind of feature learning approach, uh, which take in the raw samples. 
Uh, and the dotted ones are basically different classifiers using these expert features like higher order moments uh, to classify. So here you can see, you know, in the best case for both, we get, you know, three or four dB sensitivity improvement uh, with these methods, um, which is pretty exciting. Um, three or four dB is a lot in some worlds. Um, so, uh, and then, yeah, so, so, so move on. All right, so one of the other cool things you can do is uh, if you take, uh, for instance, if we look at this network, uh, our, our output is, is 11 values, right? So these, is, these correspond to one per modulation class. You typically use like a one hot encoding uh, for a classifier. Um, if, you, if you go back one layer, um, you have this feature map of activations between each layer. Um, and, and generally, this is reducing in size as you go through the network to become a more and more concise representation of the information. Um, so if we go back one layer and we just take these activations here, um, we actually now have a, basically a compressed representation of the signals from the input uh, in this feature map space. Um, and so what's really cool is we can start now using that compressed representation uh, to just kind of visualize, you know, where, uh, where are these signals in this kind of abstract modulation space, right? And so now we can start to cluster them and, you know, we have this basis now that is relatively good at separating a bunch of different signal types. Um, and so this is kind of interesting because, you know, if a new modulation pops up, you know, if these features generalize, you know, we hope we'll get a new cluster over here or something that's discernible so that we can start to recognize things online uh, without having to train it for every explicit case uh, kind of ahead of time. Um, all right. So then this, is, this goes to some of the work that we did this week at the Hackfest. Um, and so... Uh, how many times, has, I guess raise your hand if you've ever written a, a flow graph that's like a usurp source through a head to a vector sink, right? I feel like, okay, we got a handful. So, so sometimes it feels silly to use Gainer Radio when you, all you want to do is just grab a chunk of samples off a radio. Um, and so that's the whole point of this uh, Py, NumPy UHD wrapper. Um, and so this is just like a super, the thinnest interface you could have to say, you know, tune my radio somewhere uh, and grab some samples from it. Um, and so, super simple. Um, and so, what we're doing here is, uh, it, this makes it really quick to just take little looks all over the spectrum uh, and generate spectrograms for them. Um, so if we do that, we can start to get all these samples of different bands uh, that are all around us. Um, and so this is just kind of a sampling of a bunch of spectrograms across, uh, you know, common bands. So if we use this in a ConvNet, we can also build a classifier for the different bands. This is not a very good one at the moment, um, there, but that's just because the slides were um, a bit late. Uh, but so uh, it's not necessarily that exciting to classify which band you're on because, you know, we have allocation schemes. This isn't really that useful. Um, but the thing that's really interesting about it is uh, we learn these sets of features for each band that make that band what it is. So like the LTE downlink band is filled with LTE signals that have all the properties and features of an LTE signal in the downlink. Uh, and so our network, as it's learning this, uh, it starts to learn all these features uh, within, you know, that comprise that band. Um, and so what we can do is we can now take um, any random spectrogram that comes in, like these two, uh, and we can look at uh, where in that input spectrogram were there uh, activations that led to thinking it was that class, right? So, so we can say, you know, what in, what in this image makes us think it's LTE uplink, right? Uh, and so if you do that, um, you can look at and get this um, uh, localization mask uh, that's used in, you know, in, in imagery for, for object segmentation. We can do the same thing in spectrum. So we can now say, uh, well, once we've trained these features, we can take in arbitrary spectrograms and really identify what's going on where um, and start labeling things. Um, all right, so then kind of the, I think the last kind of little um, application thing here, and I'm really, 
this is the thing. If you look at machine learning and comms, this is what I'm, I think, most excited about right now. Um, and the whole idea here is um, uh, if you think about a comm system at its most basic form, it's really like you have some bits somewhere, and at some other location, you just want a good estimate for those bits, right? That's kind of all it is. You're just taking bits in and trying to reconstruct them somewhere else. Um, and, so, and so that's pretty much what an autoencoder does in machine learning, is it, it takes some input, it goes through a couple different representations of it, and it tries to reconstruct the input. Um, and so if we, if we cast the basic communications problem uh, as an autoencoder, um, we have this case where we go through some input, we form some new encoding of those input bits, uh, we go through some channel impairment, which we don't control. This is kind of defined by a wireless environment. Uh, and then we go through this decoder representation that somehow transforms the samples re we receive back into bits. Um, and really, that's the whole process we want to optimize. So uh, we can treat this as just a, an optimization of a reconstruction process um, where we have this layer in the middle that introduces this randomness uh, that, that mirrors what a wireless channel does. Um, and so. Uh, what's really cool here is we can let this thing learn now some completely arbitrary physical layer. Um, you know, we don't need PSK or any of these things anymore. Uh, and we can actually start getting reasonably good uh, capacities um, out of these encodings. Um, so we can now, you know, just learn a, a radio uh, for a specific radio environment, you know, without uh, any expert knowledge of the past 70 years of signal processing. Um, which is pretty crazy. Um, so if we do that, we can start plotting uh, basically VER curves. Uh, and these are, these are kind of some old ones that aren't as clean. Um, but you can see that, you know, in some cases we can, we can outperform um, the, the performance you would get on a modulation without any error correction, um, which is really cool because it means uh, the encoders and decoders that we're learning can actually learn a little bit of error correction as well. So you're now, you're, you're basically learning something that does better than just a normal modulation scheme. Um, so uh, there's a, I'll, well, I'll mention it later. So, so this is just an example of a couple different runs and what, you know, what the resulting learned bases look like in this case. Um, yeah, and there's many, many things that affect this. So there's right now still a million kind of tuning dimensions that, that you, you can look at while training these things. And, and optimizing all, over all of those is still kind of a, a big challenge right now. Uh, and, and right now, the other big challenges are this, you know, this works for very small code words. Um, but if you try to scale this to like, you know, 1024 bits or something that LTE might use uh, in an LDPC code, uh, it's much harder to scale it. So that's one of the things we're looking at now is how do you scale this up to like uh, more real situations uh, and over the air. Um, all right, and then lastly, um, so when we learn that encoder and decoder, um, the decoder has to learn how to translate from some channel representation to the bits, right? Um, now, if you do that uh, just naively, um, we, we get some process that, can, that takes a long time to converge, right? Because it's having to learn how to estimate the channel, somehow apply those corrections, and then somehow uh, go to a, back to a bit information encoding. Um, so there's this notion uh, in, from vision of uh, attention models. Um, and the whole idea of these attention models is that instead of learning uh, some arbitrary transform like how to equalize, uh, you can simply break the network into learned parameter estimation, um, kind of an expert transform like equalization, uh, and then our learned you know, uh, decoder. And so in doing this, you basically tell the system, well, OK, this is, this is how you would apply equalizer taps, or this is how you'd apply frequency correction if you knew how far off it was. And it turns out, if you do that, this converges like much, much faster, uh, orders of magnitude faster here. Um, and we get you know, significantly better performance as well in the autoencoder case. Um, so it's like we're kind of helping the system along to, to learn the basic physics of the problem. 
um, to reduce the complexity that the machine learning has to fit. Um, and so this is, this is kind of uh, exciting that this works. Um, and, and so on top of that, there's this whole problem of like, you know, we have a whole discipline of estimation and detection, right? Um, and it's interesting to just look at, uh, you know, can we treat these estimation problems as just machine learning regression problems? Um, and so we started looking at that. And if you look at, this is comparing the, the map estimator for center frequency estimation with basically just a uh, neural net trained to do regression uh, to generate estimates for the same thing. Um, and if we do that, uh, and this is under a Rayleigh fading channel. So uh, if we do that, we get a slightly tighter distribution from the regression process. Um, and so this speaks to like, why do you want to do this? You know, we have, we have a lot of great analytic models for these, um, but one of the problems with them is there, many of them are derived under much more simplistic channel assumptions. Um, and so if we can do this with real data and regression, then we can start to model you know, all kinds of nonlinear effects and all kinds of much more complex channel models than we can in our analytic forms. Um, and so it's really kind of exciting about you know, where our estimation processes can go in the future with this approach. Uh, right, so ML is affecting a lot of fields in computer very quickly right now, uh, which is pretty exciting. Um, and the area of applying this to the RF and radio domain is super young. There's really not much work out there yet at all. Um, and so I think if you're a student right now looking for kind of topics to work on, this is like, you know, super ripe. Uh, and I wouldn't point you anywhere else. Um, but obviously, I'm a little biased. Uh, so um, there's also, uh, a, I have a journal article that will be appearing on Archive Monday. Uh, and it, it goes into this autoencoder and the mod rec process uh, much more rigorously. Uh, so if you're interested in a more thorough explanation, definitely go and check that out Monday. Uh, and there will be a link on radioml.org. So I'm trying to start kind of turning radioml.org into somewhat of a community for people interested in this. So, um, you know, if you would like to contribute tools or data sets or articles or examples or anything to, ra to RadioML and start contributing, like, please let me know because I would love to have your, uh, your work there. Um, and, yeah, I think that's, uh, that's about it. Any questions? questions? Yep. Um, so you mentioned about using tensorflow for signal processing. So how much, um, since you gave an example of sync and separator, um, how much work do you know that's happening out there for like developing libraries to get those DSP applications? Yeah, so, so there's not much out there at all for like radio signal processing yet. I think almost all the work has been done in computer vision. And so there's, there's just a lot of tools to do kind of computer vision operations, but very little of that has been applied to radio yet. Um, and I think that's kind of one of the niceties is that the computer vision guys are, you know, paving a lot of the roads for, you know, figuring out the, the compilers and all the back end and support issues so we can use a lot of the same infrastructure in radio without having to reinvent it. Um, I think Google said they moved like their machine learning for all of their services over to TensorFlow, <laughs> and they have like a 30 or 40 person team just supporting the TensorFlow product line now. Um, so there's a lot of you know stuff we can just take for granted at this point. So yep. Maybe we should use like the, do you have any knowledge of real time computation requirements, latencies, you know, kind of. You showed comparisons of theoretical performance, but what about like actual runtime performance? Right. Yeah. So, uh, I haven't. There's, there's not been a whole lot done on latency yet, uh, but on computational performance, um, for the Modric example, uh, I, I did a, a a op counting comparison to uh, the the kind of state of the art kind of classic algorithms, uh, and we so the initial network. Uh, was something like nine times more operations uh, 
than the, the, the classic method, right? Um, so, but it turns out then when we go in and we start doing certain things within the network, like we use uh, one by one uh, com filtering on the output of several com layers, which is a trick. And, and one by one filtering sounds very silly, and I think to most electrical engineers, because you know why would you do that? Um, but but the point of a one by one filter is actually that um, it's it's combining in the number of output channels. So. Um, you have actually N channels of 2D image coming in and M channels of 2D image going out. So you can use one by one filtering to reduce like that number of channels down. Um, and so by playing tricks like that, we were able to drive the complexity down like maybe 50x or so. Uh, and so we're now a factor of about four lower in op counts than the, the kind of classic approach um, in that application. So I think like, you know, there's a, there's a lot of things that make it attractive, right? So all, all these multi-core architectures, uh, you know, this is a very parallel thing, right? You can divide up the tensors in width and in depth uh, onto different cores. Um, and one of the other really cool things is there was a paper looking at how much representation precision do you need for these networks to work? And because uh, right now this is all done in single point, single precision floating point. Um, but they showed that you really only need four to eight bits of precision throughout the whole network um, for this to work equally well. Um, and so there's another potential, you know, huge savings in, in complexity. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I think ultimately for comms and for sensing, this is potentially drastically lower complexity than our current approaches. Yeah, so I can't do it justice here. If you'll read the paper on Monday, so the question was about coding and whether we compared to Shannon and so forth. Uh, and yes, so um, the baselines here are, uh, you know, I, I didn't want to go and put everything that's going to be released Monday yet. Um, but if you go through the, the paper that's coming out Monday, we have uh, some very, very good baselines where we're looking at comparisons to, you know, PSKs and DPSKs with, uh, with the Hamming code, and you know, we're basically right up against capacity, um, and so so we're we're much more robust there in showing you know the capacity that you can achieve with this, um, and you can come very very close to, you know, the channel limit. Switch over. Okay. All right. The next speaker. Ah.